So good afternoon for all, for our speaker, Professor Manuel, and everyone who's watching us, whatever you are, welcome. Professor Manuel, it's a great pleasure to learn with you today on the issue of the ESG and compliance and the new perspectives for the human rights agenda. My name is Victoria, and here as organizers, we have Daniela and João, and also as debaters, Ana Luisa and Matheus. Through the webinars that we are organizing, the University of Sao Paulo Business and Human Rights Working Group, we seek to address the problems increased by COVID-19 with particular gravity in Brazil, especially at the field of human rights violations by corporate actors. We are so grateful for all of you that are joining us today at these webinars that I have to say we are really thrilled with the participation of people from the four continents around and mainly for your solidarity with the challenges that we are facing here in Brazil. For those who cannot watch now, our webinar is going to be recorded and will be available on YouTube soon. Manuel Espinosa is a professor and partner at the Wolf Street Group Senior Fellow at Wharton Zicklin Center for Business Ethics Research and lecturer on the subject of compliance and ESG. And personally, I can say that also a brilliant reference for all of us here at the University of Sao Paulo. So I am gonna hand over to Professor Emmanuel to present his topic and his considerations. And after that, our debaters and participants bring their remarks. Thank you. Professor, I think you are muted, Professor Manuel. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I think you muted me uh, before. <laughs> when you oh, muted everyone. I am sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not, a, not, not a problem. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, introduction um, and for the invitation. Um, I'm I am honored to participate with you and thank for the thank you for for this organization Victoria obviously Daniela and Joao and uh, Joao I apologize for not being that respondent in the last days but it's really an honor to be here and also uh, to to have this talk with uh, friends of mine uh, people who I admire a lot like Ana Luisa and Mateus Pupe and thank you especially to Professor Eduardo Sardiniz that probably is, is uh, listening uh, for supporting these initiatives and for, for probably dropping my name to, to, to the colleagues for, con for considering uh, me as a speaker in this uh, series of of talks that you are carrying out. Uh, congratulations also for the topic and for this um, exciting initiative. Well, um, I, um, I think that um, for me it will be a little bit easier if at some point uh, we start in a dynamic dialogue uh, with the opinions of uh, Mateus and, and Ana Luisa. Uh, in order to try also to, to see the different perspectives that are relevant for the realities in, in Brazil. You know? uh, I will try not to focus on Mexico or on, on Germany and Europe, but to, to build a bridge uh, about this and what I consider that is the, the main problematic uh, overall uh, regarding ESG, and compliance um, with respect to, to human rights. So, um, let me begin because I have to begin with this. As you know, uh, this week we have 10 years of the Raji principles endorsed by the UN um, and uh, derived from these Roger principles, the well-known UNGPs, uh, there are a lot, or there has been happening a lot in from the side of 
of the soft law and recommendations um, aspects. No, uh, in Europe, obviously, you heard I think on Thursday or on, or Wednesday with the speaker from from Germany, Schanfelder, that he has a very famous um, last name that everyone, uh, every law student knows in Germany, Schoenfelder, because it's the compendium of all legislations that they have to, to, to study for the examination, for the state examination. So he talked about the LIFA ticket sets for this uh, supply chain due diligence. And I don't want to get a lot into it, but obviously it's something that is relevant by itself, but also it shows some tendons that we have to, to observe um, at another um, level, at an international and a transnational level. So this uh, UNGPs, it was obviously the first guidance for business and human rights. Uh, it was very well received on that time. It was a work of five or six years of uh, this team uh, led by, by Professor uh, Raji. And I think that 10 years after the endorsement of, the, of, of these uh, guidance principles, there are a lot that we can that we can observe as a success, but also some to-dos that are missing. No? I think it served uh, in order to create some widespread concerning the commitment or the lack of commitment of companies towards human rights, but also the obligation of states concerning human rights, because we have to differentiate these two aspects, I think, and I will come to this later. First, the obligation of the states uh, and the commitment of the private um, of the private sector. So, in this, in this, uh, in in recent years, we have observed some at an international level some um, instruments most of them concerning soft law, um, that invites or incentivates companies in order to invest or to comply with some minimal standards on, on human rights and environment. Obviously, a, a speaking in, in very basic terms, you know that compliance it's not something new. We have been living with this for the last 20 years and in some countries even more than that. And right now, ESG is like the trend and everyone is talking about ESG issues and, and what are companies doing, NGOs are investing in this, investment funds, uh, the financial sector is very into that. And obviously, the S, the S, of ESG is concerning human rights, no? uh, mostly, obviously. But in this, in this particular aspect, I think, um, well, since those are not uh, topics that are very new, uh, as well, uh, there is no, there is no, um, also, the, the Roger principles and this work of the UN is, is not new as well. But I think for me, the, the most important question is, uh, how do we prevent that now we are talking about this topic and in 10 years, we will still talk about these particular issues. No? Uh, for instance, before we were talking about compliance and CSR and then about um, GRS, and now the topic is ESG, and some people are talking about TESG together with technology or something. So someone's add um, topics like the civic space to these ESG matters, and human rights obviously always plays a role on this. 
but we i'm not sure that that uh, in 10 years we will not having these discussions again and again and again no there is obviously the work and the obligations that states have um, and we see that for instance in in the at the european level as you know there are some directives coming uh, right now there are some proposals by the parliament to the commission in order to to legislate or to 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 endorse or to draft well it's already almost drafted but to accept this draft as an directive on accountability and corporate due diligence no? uh, that is very similar to what Sean Felder professor Sean Felder presented some days ago but at the national level in this regard uh, in Germany this uh, this LIFA, LIFA gesetz. also Europe uh, right now I think uh, on on third uh, uh, June 30 um, there is this new directive um, coming or coming into force about sustainable finance uh, disclosure no this regulation on sustainable finance disclosure that it has two relevant aspects one is that companies need to to publish how they account for sustain, sustainability and the other is regarding ESG. Now they have to, to show and to demonstrate how, not only if, but how uh, do they conduct ESG due diligence. This, all of this shows us that there is, there is some tendency uh, with regards, obviously, to the state obligation of um, enhancing the regulation regarding for the pro or aim to protect uh, human rights but also there is a shift on the uh, on this task no it happened for me uh, it is happening something that we uh, experienced years ago with for instance uh, money laundering that a lot of these commitments or tasks are being shifted from the public sector to the private sector. And now the, the big companies are the ones who will be in charge of, um, of uh, will be in charge and will be liable also for these, um, for supervise that companies in tier one, especially, uh, but also in some cases and regarding some, some, um, uh, legislation of certain countries also in tier two and tier three so in the whole supply value uh, chain this is this is something that it's very relevant as well uh, for companies european or american companies uh, doing business in our countries so in the extractive industry for instance as you know there are a lot of of risks there especially regarding to human rights and um, environmental crimes um, with um, companies um, also dealing with uh, pharmace pharmaceutics or pharmaceutical companies also have this kind of, of risk that they are a little bit different than the ones that could be assumed or attributed to financial institutions, for instance. Obviously, the risk are um, are not are not the same. So, um, in our countries, what is missing? I think we have both problems. There is a very lax or very uh, there is a lack of. Um, of appropriate and adequate legislation. For instance, in Mexico, two years ago, at the beginning of 2019, uh, the Senate presented an initiative regarding CSR. 
no? And that time, a little bit too late for, for this, but uh, it didn't fly. Uh, it's there in the, fr in the freezing room of the, of the parliament. So there are a lot of uh, regulation that all, uh, other countries are implemented or have already implemented that we uh, unfortunately don't have. So then that bring us to the second part that is the commitment of the, of the private uh, sector. Uh, when we ask companies, and in my experience as consultant in compliance uh, and, integrity, and business integrity matters, when we ask companies if they have some mechanism in order to evaluate what they are doing in compliance or in ESG or for the protection of, of, of human rights, uh, the answer is, well, uh, actually not. No? What they all answer in a positive manner is that they have something. Everyone, every big company has a, a very good uh, compliance system according to them. But if we ask them how they evaluate their efforts, they, they cannot show the same, uh, the same um, positivism. No? The, they are not that uh, optimistic about this. And um, this is obviously a problem because, because at some point, we need the companies in order to comply with these obligations named uh, compliance obligations or anti-money laundering regula uh, obligations or other ESG um, kind of commitments, but also and especially regarding with, with human rights. And without the companies, I think it's very difficult. Uh, I liked uh, what Europe and some countries in Europe are doing with these Lifaket and Gesetz uh, that are attributing some responsibility to the companies in order to take a look at the whole value chain. But it's also dangerous and it's, it implies costs as well. So I think we have to wait a little bit in order to see the, the impact and the, the positive or the possible positive impact that it um, it brings no and um, this will be something interesting interesting to see also for latin american companies and for uh, observers in latin america uh, we have to 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 prove and to um, uh, to a state uh, and to look for evidence that the Mexican companies or Latin America companies within the supply chain of some European uh, large firms uh, change their uh, practices uh, according or derive from these new um, obligations. So I think this is something that we will have to, to see. And at the, uh, at the, on the other hand, um, I think that the, the, the um, principal aspect that we are missing uh, is the same problem that we are missing in compliance. The companies, companies do not know with the obligations they have to comply with. Uh, and if they don't know this in the very small aspect, in the, the very small circle of compliance, then how, what can we expect from other circle that is more, much broader, like ESG, including uh, human rights? So uh, companies, it's it's really it's really a pro a problem because the first obligation of the compliance uh, officer or of the compliance team or the legal department of a company is to analyze in real time 
all applicable regulations that they have to comply with. And you can imagine if this company is in five different countries and also has businesses in the US or probably in the US, the UK and Germany, then the interplay between all applicable jurisdictions in this case, at least eight plus, plus uh, a couple more, uh, it's something that is really, uh, well, it's impossible for most of the companies to be honest, because you, you can, you can, you can see that we, we monitor this kind, we, we do this exercise for the, uh, or with, with our consulting firm and we offer these services with right now to, uh, or to financial institutions uh, right now in Europe. And we can, um, we can assure that per jurisdiction per month, there are at least 20 or 25 different or new uh, or amendments to uh, the obligations uh, applicable to, to them according to their activities. So this is only for the financial sector. If we are talking about a company that is a little bit broader and uh, I don't know, Nestle or it's in the extractive sector or something like this, uh, we will see or we will face this problematic uh, as well or even more. There are there every day there is an amendment of uh, the legislation or some uh, member of the parliament presented a draft bill or uh, there is a press release of some relevant authority being the the chief of the financial intelligence unit for instance in the case of the of the financial institutions or uh, a very powerful ngo uh, there is a new investigation um, uh, conducted, or there is, uh, or the the jurisprudence is, uh, or there is some new case law or jurisprudence available. So this is something that we have to to first to assume and and understand because this is relevant for the compliance uh, circle or the compliance. Uh, uh, obligations and then for ESG I personally I am I'm not an expert in environmental issues for instance and I can imagine that every day there is a new local norm in in some country regarding uh, emissions regarding the quality of the water that companies uses regarding the use or the or the or the or the for, or, or to forbid the use of, of some material in all the process there is every day is coming something new and uh, it's really difficult to monitor all these legislative and regulatory amendments in real time so if they are not doing this first task then what can we expect no and with regards to human rights well, the universality of human rights implies that these companies, I'm talking about right now of multinationals, they should have uh, or they should monitor what is happening in Brazil, in Mexico, in Europe, in India, in Bangladesh, uh, in, uh, in Ivory Coast, um, code, um, in, in, in any country in order to enhance their legal structure and procedural structure within the companies to comply with a minimal standard of uh, the protection of, of uh, human rights. No? Um, furthermore, when we talk about ESG, as you know, it's it's a topic that is uh, it's a it's a trend. It's very fashion right now to talk about this. There are a lot of uh, publications coming and uh, just published this year and the year and the past year. Uh, COVID was a topic that uh, gave ESG some traction, obviously, 
Um, but what we what what we see as well is that in Latin America, I don't think that this is a a topic fully understood by companies, or at least not yet. No, we have seen what BlackRock is doing we have seen in mexico some investment funds that they want to allocate some resources uh, to esg oriented uh, projects or companies and they were not able to do it because they didn't find uh, adequate uh, esg oriented projects no uh, i just saw what the bank of of brazil has published some days ago regarding these uh, funds for for ESG oriented projects. And uh, let's see how it, how it goes. In Mexico, at least the first round, it was not a very big success, no? And if we consider that uh, a very important part of S is human rights, uh, including labor law, including um, gender um, and so on, then we can we can um, assume that there, there is a lot to do uh, for the companies but i think the incentive the incentive is sometimes um, in in the wrong place i think companies they don't have in my perspective and we are conducting um, an exercise in Mexico with some companies together with, with um, a very good friend of mine and very respected uh, expert on ESG, Ana Maria Petersen. Um, and what we are trying to do is not putting the companies competing uh, against each other. No, we are not trying to do a ranking because I think it's some kind of disincentivize the, the companies in the low part of this ranking. We, our aim is to put the companies to compete against themselves, no? And I think this is an important part. They have to compete against the same company the year before. And that uh, includes showing some performance or uh, adopting some indicators that uh, help them to demonstrate some advances in uh, in certain categories. Obviously, uh, as you you are experts on this, obviously there are topics that you can evaluate very easily. No, like the reduce of the use of energy, uh, the, of the the use of water, uh, the increase of the minimal wage according to the not to the legislation or the legal um, obligation of the company to the to, to the labor law but to the but more according to the to the cost of life no so that kind of issues is easy or easier to to evaluate um, but they are complicated issues like especially in governance no if, what are you doing uh, with regards to the prevention of corruption with uh, gender with gender inequality uh, because it it's not only regarding how many people do i how many women do i have in my company is what uh, uh, rights do i assure ensure to them no for instance, in one of the companies that we that we are working with, um, at the beginning they told us that they were doing everything possible on, on in order in equity, uh, gender equity aspects, no, and they are paying everyone the same and so on and so on. And then we realize they are complying to all um, um, legal obligations, and it's true. It was true uh, indeed, but then we we saw that uh, the maternity period in Mexico, I don't know in Brazil, in other, in other countries, but it's 40 days, 40 days before the birth and 40 days after that. 
And obviously companies are complying with this, but 40 days, it doesn't allow uh, employees, female employees in order to compete for a better position if they have to come back to their uh, workplaces after 40 days or 40 days after giving uh, birth, no? Many of them, they, they um, decide to leave the company and to take one year off in order to be with, with, the, uh, with the babies and so on. So these kind of indicators, I think this is, this, is, uh, this is crucial because we all know that there are a lot of indicators. There is gene, there, there is G, GRI, uh, there are many companies that uh, provides us some examples on this. Obviously, they are the, the, the SDGs for the public sector or for municipalities or for local governments and so on. But we have to adopt them to our reality. And that is something that we are uh, doing in, in this uh, small project in, in Mexico because uh, first step is to adopt it to the reality because we have different problems obviously that the problems in brazil or in europe we cannot only take the gene standards or the gri indicators and try to modulate them and putting to the mexican reality we try it uh, at the beginning but it doesn't work uh, really and the second step in my opinion is to get the feedback from the companies uh, themselves, no? They, we have to work with them in order to know what is relevant uh, for them. What are the, 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 the priorities? If, for example, some companies where we, uh, that we are working with, they are in a very dry part of the state of, the state of Jalisco in, in West uh, Mexico. And for them, the priority number one before gender, before, before um, environment, generally speaking, is water, no? And water is one of the first uh, things for them is crucial. Uh, so at some point, the, the feedback for the companies in order to set out the priorities is uh, is crucial and we ha cannot in my opinion we cannot come with some esg indicators or with some compliance obligations including human rights and pretend that this is what they have to comply in this uh, to comply with and in this order and they have to invest uh, their money and their efforts in in doing so we have to to hear them as well you know, the problematic of uh, of the region, of the community, and of the company itself. Then, um, in this particular regard, um, or combining these two aspects that we mentioned, the lack of the, this constant uh, monitoring of uh, applicable legislation and regulation, and the feedback from the company and from the region, I think in within the ESG um, life or um, activities, uh, it's, it's crucial to see or to measure not only uh, if they have uh, implement something. We have to measure the positive impact that this measure produ produce or produces. No? And this is the, the most relevant part, in, in my opinion, regarding the, the evaluation. And I just mentioned some examples that are really simple, but then regarding uh, human rights, obviously it has to be a little bit more elaborated than, than uh, the methodology has to be a little bit more elaborated than measuring the energy uh, consume of the, of the company obviously but we have to to concentrate or to focus on the positive um, the positive impact because everything what we are seeing now is like a checkbox 
if they have this policy, if they have published this or that, if they have in the in the uh, labor contracts, if they, if they have a um, anti money laundering clause or anti corruption clause, or at some point it will come a uh, human rights protection of human rights clause and so on. This will come at some point, but it's not about uh, having a checkbox of things being implemented or not. It's, it's about measuring how or the impact that these measures uh, have and towards the stakeholders, the shareholders, the community, um, the society, the environment, the employees, and everyone which has uh, some relation to the, to, the, to the legal entity at some point, no? And then going a little bit, and I will finalize with this, uh, um, leaving this legal or, yeah, legal aspect aside, I think uh, all of this is worthless if the companies don't implement the, the correct um, measure or install the, the control in all the, the, the process map, you know? Every company has this, uh, they have this huge process map that are going from uh, production to sales with marketing, with know your customer responsibilities and so on. But if we as legal experts, we tell them, okay, you have to comply with this and there are these, these UN principles and there is this new legislation and so on. But without saying in this particular uh, part of your process, you have to install this control and this person is the, the responsible for the oversight of this control. And if you don't have this control, then uh, this, uh, the, 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 uh, those are the risks, then it's worthless. We have to speak at some point the same language that the company uh, do. You know? And we are not talking only with the, the legal department or the compliance department, or at some point the ESG department. We have to talk the, the same language in the, uh, regarding the, the process map. And we have to go there and say, look, there is this new legislation or this is this new, new case law, um, this court decision, and that implies that you have to implement this and in this way. Before doing that, I think it's very, the, the risk that we come with some recommendations, guidelines for the companies, and uh, we don't produce an, any impact, I think is uh, it's, uh, huge uh, on this particular regard. So um, I pretty much like, like the, this, what is happening right now regarding the due diligence, obviously it's a way of uh, helping companies to comply with some standards. I think uh, until now we have uh, experienced a failure of some states uh, in their obligation of protecting human rights and enhancing uh, corporate social responsibility. This is, this is uh, a fact, but right now we have other 10 years uh, to come with something a little bit more creative and really incentivize companies to uh, implement these kind of measures in a truly way in order to uh, get um, financial benefits. No? It's very important that we, that we tell them, okay, these kind of measures will help you in the reputation, will help you regarding the clients. You saw that with with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and Coca-Cola uh, the week ago, no? So the image of the companies, obviously it's very important uh, that they will be have, uh, will have some access 
to investment uh, funds uh, by applying this kind of, of policies internally that they will protect their companies of some legal risk, obviously some financial risk as well. But I think this is a little bit more effective than coming and saying you have to comply with this because otherwise uh, there is a fine or the, there is this authority or this reg uh, regulator that will be after you. I think at least in our countries that uh, didn't uh, work that well <clears throat> so far. And then finally, I also think that we cannot miss uh, another topic that is increasing a lot and is, is the class actions. No? The class actions is a huge topic in the US and in Europe. Uh, at some point, or there are some countries in, in Latin America where this topic is increasing. In Brazil uh, is, is one of them. And class actions, uh, companies have some fear to class actions. No? We, we see the, the ruling, it was for Nestlé uh, just last week, uh, where the, the court ruled for Nestlé in a case regarding um, slavery in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, but you see that the, the companies, the, the association of, of uh, companies, they fear about this uh, kind of legislation, the, the Alien Tort Statute, and in the other countries where class actions is allowed and is enhanced, then there is a big opportunity to detect the victims of corporate crime, uh, putting them together and uh, making them more powerful uh, uh, with re or towards uh, the companies. No? We have seen a lot of cases recently. We are seeing as well that uh, the, the finance litigation business is increasing a lot. There are now a lot of investment funds uh, investing in litigation processes all around the world, no? mostly regard with regards to, to environment and consumer protection, uh, like Volkswagen and those kind of cases. But at some point, it will be regarding human rights. Not only because it could be financially very profitable, but because of the reputation for this, that these investment funds uh, can get. And I know, I am sure you are aware of these um, websites, uh, for example, this corporate and human rights, uh, or business and human rights or something uh, like this. And you see like the, the world map with all cases uh, regarding and class actions regarding human rights. And it's impressive. You know? There are thousands of, of cases there. You only have to pick one and uh, finance the victims or the affected people. Uh, and then uh, you have a case. So, I think bottom line is how we incentivize companies to comply and to be more serious regarding not only compliance and ESG, but especially um, the protection of human rights. Um, and well, I think um, first they have to, to, to understand and to know and to to leave this darkness aside and to really know the obligations uh, coming from the, from the hard law and the soft law that they have to comply with. And probably another mechanism alternative will be to uh, research a little bit more and invest a little bit more in these uh, class actions as a tool for uh, making companies to, to comply with their legal and regulatory obligations. And well, I'm happy to hear Mateus and Ana Luisa critics and uh, comments. And obviously of, from every one of you. So thank you so much.
Professor, you brought very uh, enlightening issues and I share many concerns that you brought around ESG and compliance. I must say that I am really concerned about my PhD after your remarks and I hope Professor Eduardo is not listening now. Before, before, my, uh, uh, enfim, before my questions, I would like to greet all of the academics that we have here from the EMEP MBA on business ethics under the supervision of Professor Gustavo Sa Diniz that I just forgot to mention uh, in the beginning. We have full house today. Uh, I personally have a lot of questions, but I would like to invite and hear the debaters, Ana Luisa and Mateus, to present their remarks first, as well as our participants. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. It's just a, a, a real pleasure because Mano is an old friend. Professor Mano is just a, a, a spectacular profession and an old friend, a lovely one. And I'm very pleased to hear uh, today to know uh, Professor Mateus also. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I would say that uh, I agree with a lot of points written by uh, Professor Manu, and I was thinking while he was uh, uh, talking about really what prevents us from discussing all of this again in 10 years, like he said at the beginning of uh, uh, his, uh, his speech. Well, I think ESG won't, it's a point of no return. It's like compliance. It's a point of no return because of the economic profits. Not because the big companies are really concerned about the environmental uh, uh, problems or about human rights, because if they were, they wouldn't uh, go to uh, countries like countries in Africa and try to, uh, to get some profit there where maybe legislation is not so hard about human rights or about uh, sustainability. Uh, but because it's an uh, economic competition differential. And I agree with Manuel when he says that this is not the ideal. Companies shouldn't be uh, disputing between them. But how can we uh, convince them that uh, uh, applying ESG First of all, applying uh, effective and uh, a real compliance department beyond of this, applying an effective ESG uh, department and ESG uh, principles uh, um, inside them. And my, my big concern today is about the growing of a certificate companies market. Like we have in, in other uh, uh, areas like privacy data and like also compliance, but we have this in ESG. Uh, a lot of companies will develop a lot of measures, a lot of metrics uh, to say that your company is better than mine because you have ESG uh, departments and ESG fellows concerns and uh, worried about sustainability, human rights and uh, governance. Okay, but how can we understand the content is really aligned with ESG principles? It's the same in compliance. We have uh, uh, some certification saying that you are uh, ISO uh, 37,000, ISO 46,000, you are ISO 9001, uh, and lots of this, but is the leadership really committed? The employees inside the, the, the companies, they understand the importance of the sustainability. How can I say to an employee inside of one of these big companies that it's important to respect uh, diversity, it's important to respect human rights, but his, uh, uh, his real concern is to keep his job. In a country like Brazil, 
uh, where we don't have jobs for everyone. I doubt that a lot of employees are really engaged inside their company about problems of sustainability, about problems of uh, diversity, about problems of gender. Because there is a real uh, conflict because uh, it's competitive. Someone can take my job away. So uh, I'm not worried about uh, uh, really uh, the effect, the impact of this, but I'm worried about keeping my job. Because of this, I have to uh, comply with the rules of the company. But is, am I really committed with it? And the problem is, uh, well, the problem and maybe a part of the solution. Governments are applying sanctions, economic sanctions between them because of ESG. Uh, this, of course, will be replying for the private companies because private companies are a very important item in this chain. Without the private company's engagement, nothing will be done. But again, they will only do this if they can, uh, uh, if they can see if they can have this economic profit, if they have some profit uh, because of this. And uh, on the other hand, we have this marketing solution. This market solution uh, we call here greenwashing. And we can uh, understand that we don't have enforcement enough to understand when someone is really applying ESG. And again, we don't know the real content of ESG. It depends on your country. It depends on your uh, self uh, understanding. Because it's yesterday, just uh, because of sustainability, Yesterday was hearing that here in Brazil, the soy production, the agribusiness, uh, it has increased a lot. But the bean production is being reducing uh, along the years. It's important to have soy production. Of course, agribusiness is a very important business in Brazil, but we have to feed our population. So how can I uh, uh, demand an ESG application and understanding from my society, from my population, if I don't have been enough to uh, feed my population. If I'm only uh, concerned with economic concerns, if I'm uh, increasing the soy production. Of course, there are a lot of jobs, a lot of uh, communities that really depend on it, but we must understand the whole scenario. Uh, and again, about the, the, the enforcement, we had some examples in Brazil. Uh, in German, Professor Manuel has the great example of Volkswagen. Uh, Volkswagen uh, had a great uh, marketing campaign about sustainability and everything. Then we saw the, the, the pollution emission, the cheating pollution emission uh, that appeared from Volkswagen. And in Brazil, we have value. Vale is a company, it was always a pride, a national pride to be, uh, uh, to have Vale. Uh, it was a personal pride to work at Vale, and as well as other companies that uh, no one wants to say now that works or worked uh, once. But Vale was always our, uh, our pride. But Vale had some serious uh, incidents in Brumadinho and in Mariana. But before of it, she was always ranked in the green ranking. She was always well ranked in the green ranking. So how can we uh, prevent from this? Again, enforcement. Uh, Professor Manuel said, and I read about it, there is a new law in German that now you have to enhance your due diligence in your supply chain. Depending if you have uh, the size of your company, I think something about 3,000 employees. So you have to enhance this due diligence. Very good. Uh, well, how will the government inspect if the company is really doing this enhanced due diligence? Will it be just a ticket box? 
because I can say here in Brazil, we have uh, really difficult to have public employees with the proper expertise to say and to respect if a company is complying, if a company is uh, doing what she should do, what it should do. So I would, uh, I will pass to, to Mateus because of the, the time. I don't want to be too long because of the, the organizers. They will uh, uh, call me to stop in any time. But I will call Mateus to, to this debate. It's a very good one. And I would like to hear from Professor Manuel. Uh, how is his feeling about this? How can we measure? How can we, how can we say that ESG is real effective? It's a real thing. It's not something just for marketing. It's not just something to be well ranked and to have profits. Uh, uh, and I'm, uh, I will give you a spoiler. I think probably we don't have this real answer. I think this is the one million answer everybody uh, uh, is looking for, but just for the, uh, uh, just for the debate. Thank you again, and please, Matos, it's with you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, Ana Luisa. Manuel, it's a great pleasure to hear you about this topic and to see you again. Uh, not in person, I'm afraid, but virtual is the, the, the solution for now. Uh, I would like to thank you, of course, Professor Gustavo Saad and Professor Eduardo Saad. Uh, for this opportunity. I believe this debate is of great importance, especially, specifically with this explosion of ESG's discussions over the last days and over the last weeks. Uh, it's not so recently in Brazil, uh, but it's a very trending topic, so to say. And uh, I believe that uh, that might be, that can be a good thing, of course, but taking this opportunity to to address this specific point, that why, why ESG is at the mainstream right now. I have heard uh, about a consultant a, while, a few days ago. He told me this, this, the, that he believes the uh, a very experienced profession of several years of um, practical knowledge and practical as an economist and a consultant for companies and so on, he told me that he believes that ESG is just a trend um, marketing thing that is created for reframing old indexes and old uh, measurements that we had already in place, just a strategy to sell something. Uh, at first, I, I heard him, I was thinking about this. My first instinct was to say, no, that's not, the, not true. And then I was thinking a bit deeper about it, might be true. And at the end, uh, I came to the following conclusion. ESG might be a new way to reframe other indexes or better to consolidate other indexes, but we do need to have in mind and to take into account that society also evolves. Uh, surely what was true uh, in the 80s, it's absolutely not true today and how the executives and how the companies behave uh, all over those years are definitely changing. So also as the expectations of the society change with the time and uh, also the older indexes are no longer um, accurate, so to say, and we do need uh, to give a new name, but also the new, a new content to it, and it becomes even more important in some aspects that we didn't consider before, so to say. Surely, uh, especially the social aspect and the environmental aspect for the ES are changing, and we do need to, to take into account that uh, the inclusion factor of the employees are a very important team today that's absolutely something that uh, has been ignored in the past. Also, when we had some index that would measure similar things, what wasn't that important. Uh, environmental aspect, absolutely something that changed and is indeed a, a very uh, key aspect for our company today. 
it might be true that it's just a matter of profit, but ultimately the function of a company is to generate profit. So they are uh, at a, a ultimate goal, not willing to please society, but to make some profit. That's, that it's not wrong, but they need to have side goals, uh, not the only one. And when we do address the SDGs, they, they can create something better for the, the whole aspect. On this topic, I would say, going back to what Ana Luisa just said about employees, that they are perhaps worried about the job, and not very um, keen about the environmental aspect of it or the social impact of the SDGs and just trying to keep the positions. Uh, it is true, I agree with you, but we do need to take into account as well something that uh, I believe Kelman described as a Harvard economist by the time he wrote a paper about compliance and with the three steps, the three topics of compliance that we do need to have in mind, that would be compliance as the moment where corporations accept influence in order to achieve a favorable reaction from the market, managing calculating risks internally to maximize utility and assure that reputational damages are avoided, uh, obtaining a favorable react reaction from the market, society or its peers on the site, and surely this, uh, I would interpret Kelman a bit different as a step and not only a, some, uh, as a list. And Third, second step, identification as the moment where most of the companies adopted already compliance practices are willing to do, and doing so they tend towards accepting influence in order to establish a self-defining relation with the market, with society, and with government. And I believe ESG drives us through towards this path now. And that ultimately, internationalization, that's a step that we are not there yet, surely, where lawful and societal desirable behaviors will be assimilated by management, society, and of course, the, by the employees, accepting influencing, influence and behavior, which is translated to a natural developed actions and practice without further controls, enforcement, or rational calculations, and they are intrinsically rewarding. Surely, now they are uh, concerned about the jobs, but the reiterated practice of social and environmental aspects that are incorporated to the company's uh, goals, so to say, besides the profit, will make them eventually transform this into something natural for themselves, something that uh, are part of the job as such, do not park in front of your neighbor's garage, so to say, something that is uh, ultimately intrinsically rewarding for themselves as part of the daily life. And surely, social accountability, it's, it plays a incredible relevant factor on this and the ESGs, especially when we consider the youngest generations that are coming into the market and as a workforce and they are also becoming eventually uh, corporate property leaders, this plays a different role as it did before. And uh, I believe the law as such a reflection in society, it adjusts itself to reflect the new anxieties of society and the new desires and wishes. And that's something, it's a process that we are observing with the ECG, ESG movement. Uh, the compliance ESG, we, we did have compliance before and now it's, it's taking a step forward, a step forward on this path to internalize these behaviors and complying with other practices that are ultimately desired by society itself and not only by uh, because they are environmental friendly or so, but also because they are being demanded from those uh, yeah, with, from those that they are ultimately the consumers, the society where they are inserted to, in and yeah and so on. Surely, when we observe this, this uh, the social accountability plays an incredibly important role on this, uh, mostly because we are in an age of social media and information flow is growing faster and faster than before. And surely uh, an impact of a bad decision as such the valid, valid it here in Brazil, repercutes and hate uh, and resonates all over the world almost in the same day, so to say. And so the damages are indeed too big to be ignored. Uh, we had this problem a while back with Volkswagen and the diesel scandal and the diesel gate. And surely the countries where the environmental played a different 
uh, educate well before they had a substantial market losses. So this impacts directly on the profit. So which means it closed the circle as the companies are more concerned about the profit and the ESGs uh, are, uh, so to say, perhaps a, a side goal. It, it, it goes all together, right? And is it something from the certification industry? Might be as well, because we do not, but we do not have some proper indexes yet. All the companies are current, especially with, when we take this uh, Brazil as a, as a focus group, we have several companies uh, describing themselves as easy ESG compliant, so to say, and then that are stating that they are implementing ESG practices. They are environmental, sustainable, or they are implementing good governance practice. They are uh, exerting some impact on the society. They are very inclusive companies or so on, but there are no actual measures for this yet, so to say. Uh, perhaps one on another, but not a majorly uh, defined and something widely spread measures that we can use as such to, 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 to control this process and to really affirm that the company is indeed concerned about this or they are just doing something uh, as a marketing uh, approach and so the greenwash. Surely this is indeed, uh, we are in deep need of this change and we are in a substantial need for, uh, it, it is indiscussable that we do need ESGs. Uh, we do need some, that corporations, so to say, have the ultimate goal as to be responsible friendly, uh, that they are compliant uh, with a proper compliance in place and not just a cosmetic one, not just something that they, tell themselves that it is a compliance, but in, in fact, it's not. And a proper governance system with transparency towards society and surely the social aspect as, as well, that they are indeed concerned. This is desirable and mutual benefits, not only for the society, but also for the companies. It, at the end, it does reflect on the, the profits, so to say, and it will be eventually a must go for the companies, especially when you consider that the youngest generation that is very more, more concerned about those uh, situations than the generations before. And I do believe that we do need to measure and uh, we cannot improve what cannot be measured. And when we establish some pragmatic aspects for ESG compliance and uh, how to effectively measure them and how to effectively implement, this will be something more than a, a, a topic situation or a marketing discussion, but of course, uh, something that really is, helps to improve the companies and society itself. So I'm not, I'm not going to belong any longer. So please, maybe we can go to the... May I? comment on this, uh, Victoria? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Well, th thank you, Ana Luisa and Mateus, for your observations and, and points. Uh, I cannot disagree with you, obviously. Uh, I think you highlighted very important topics. To uh, After hearing you, or while I was hearing you, I, I definitely agree with you, but I, I fear that ESG, there is the, a danger that ESG is like a, an elite debate, no? Uh, for the consumers, for instance, consumers who can decide what they buy, probably they will, um, they will go for the environment uh, friendly product or something like that. But we are not talking about the majority of the population. No? Uh, the majority of the population will go for the cheapest milk and the cheapest meat uh, without any kind of, of consideration. Um, and the same happens as well on the business side. Uh, the companies, the rich companies that can invest in ESG 
and documentate and do marketing about, uh, on this particular regard is the minimal uh, standards, no? the, the minimal uh, number. The majority of, of businesses, they, this kind of topics, it's a little bit too far away. Uh, it's still a little bit far away. But at the same time, I hope, coming to what Ana Luisa said, that now it's a point of no return. And what Mateo said, said as well, that, that it, the DSG came to, to be here despite it's a trend or not. Uh, I really hope that this, this is like this. I think <clears throat> one, of the, one of the facts that we cannot uh, forget is that now there are people talking about ESG that probably five years ago we didn't happen, no? And now we have some uh, success case of this. I always put the same example uh, of this. I don't know if you have that in Brazil. I'm, I'm sure this Beja uh, sneakers, no, uh, with a V. They don't do marketing. They they don't. They only have a website, and their product is that they don't use leather. They use rubber from the Amazonia or something like this. I don't know, but they are vegan sneakers and they are a huge success in Europe without doing marketing, without sponsoring a famous um, uh, tennis players or football players. But again, this is a product that is not cheap. So uh, I think w right now we are from the side of the consumer and the side of the producer, we are facing ESG uh, only in the elite, but at the same time, we are discussing these topics, and not only we, but the courts as well. Uh, some days ago, the Dutch court ruled against Shell regarding a case on uh, carbon emissions, not only from the company, from, but the scope three. That means like the 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 consumers of Shell and the court in his in its decisions quote or said that it it was based on on the civil uh, the obligation coming from the civil law in order to oversight uh, the the some environmental principles but all also regarding the Roger principles or the uh, UNGPs, considering them as an, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly, but as an internationally uh, accepted soft law instrument that is man that sets obligations for uh, states and also for companies. And so we, this kind of, of rules or of core decisions are important because we will see that uh, more, you know, in a more often way in the forthcoming years, I think. But I, I think the discussion is ESG in Europe and the US and uh, another whole, wholly complete discussion is regarding uh, all our countries, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, as you mentioned before, and the certification, what Ana Luisa said, I think it, it's also part of this game, no? It's not available for every company. We, in our firm, we certificate this ISO anti-corruption, the uh, 37001. And <laughs> to be honest, it's completely useless, no? <laughs> it helps company in order to know that they have to comply with some uh, topics, but if they help them or not, or if they prevent some activities or not, they are not interested in that. They want to, they, uh, want to have the certification, the anti-corruption certification, but it costs. So it's not available for, for any company and that makes it very tricky. It's not accessible to those that cannot pay for that, and those who pay for that, 
it's only to get the stamp and without caring a lot about the 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 positive uh, impact that they can have and uh, when you were talking about greenwashing i remember a paper of of william laufer i think i don't know 1990 something about greenwashing you know? it's almost 30 years ago uh, and he was talking already about this kind of of, uh, of problematic as well as cosmetic compliance and all of these mantras that we that we try to avoid or, or sometimes without a lot of success so i think uh, that these roger principles the global compact the sdgs uh, these new european directives uh, the core decisions i think they contribute in so far that they put these topics on the business agenda but i think it's a it's a good beginning obviously it's not enough but it's necessary that we start talking about uh, these issues and then as you mentioned Matos, uh, at some point with some social pressure that the societies are changing and the people who right now can decide between two options a lot of them decide for the more eco-friendly or the more uh, or the product we produce by a company with higher integrity standards or, or i don't know but still a small part of the of the consumers obviously uh, the other ones are guided by the the price uh, obviously and if it's accessible or not so um but we i mean no change uh, is so fast no i remember i remember when i was thinking uh, when i was in in i was living in europe but i was going very frequently to mexico and i said you know in europe is forbidden to to smoke in bars and restaurants and they said well in mexico that is never going to happen five years later it happened so social change happened no some of them not that fast than others but it's it's uh, it's a process and if we put together the regulators and um, the regulated in this sense the the authorities the courts uh, the the legislative uh, authorities and the, on the other side the the companies the private sector and the consumer in those cases that are applicable then probably in 10 years we will still talking about this but probably 20 or 30 years uh, not so i i hope and i think leadership is is missing obviously but if we identify as consultants or in-house lawyers or advisors or what, whatsoever if we identify uh, very concrete benefits for the company especially financial benefits then we have more tools in order to convince uh, companies to go in in this direction i think uh, and i don't want to repeat myself but i think that uh, access to to investment funds um, reputation uh, are topics that could be monetized at some point as well class actions i think that is it's a fundamental way in order to avoid this for especially for those companies who uh, are b2c and um, and we have to to identify these topics on esg as we have developed in this project a lot of the indicators regarding e are not on are not a waste of money or they those indicators they don't ask you for money or they don't take money for the company but they save money to the company no reducing the the water consumptions the energy the energy consumption 
it's, it's, it's good for the company and for the society and the community, but especially for the finances of, of, the, of the company. Having your personal and your employees happy with their, um, with their jobs and having a minimal standard of uh, social return on investment and that kind of issues uh, produces that uh, or avoids uh, a very high, I don't, know, I don't know the word in English, fluctuants or, you know, that the employees uh, go after two years and you, you train them you work with them for six months, but they are not happy with, with their jobs, and then they go. And that costs money for uh, for the to the company. Uh, the employees that stay uh, mean uh, saves uh, saves money uh, for companies. So there are a lot of issues that can be monetarized, and I think that in the language of the company we have to go into this direction. How do we monetize ESG and compliance for the company in order to convince them to invest in these issues at, uh, as a first step? Obviously, we will find some companies that they really want to make things right and so on, but they are once, once in, in hundreds, no? So, um, well, I, I will just comment this and uh, thank you for your contributions and comments. Professor, thank you very much. And um, how much time do you do we still have to continue the debate? I I have time. My my wife took my children to sleep, so I have time. <laughs> So uh, I would like to invite all of the participants, if they like to, to present their questions, um, they can open their camera and microphones or even um, here in the chat so that we can read. So uh, uh, while there isn't, there aren't any questions yet, I think I could address a question meanwhile. So uh, Professor, thank you very much for your presentation. And also, um, I am also, also thankful for our debaters, Ana Luisa and Mateus, for such an insightful debate. Uh, I would pose a, a quick question here. Um, something that is being debated in this new ESG investment milestone uh, is that it could possibly cause or deepen a phenomenon described as overcompliance, as as in the and in, in the NBA class they were discussing before this meeting. Uh, this means that increasing compliance, GRC, and perhaps ESG investments by big firms could also create a context in which big firms could uh, strategically undermine small firms' participation in the development of an economic activity, such as familiar agriculture, for example. This could also be viewed as big, more aggressive firms undermining uh, the participation of more sustainable small businesses and thus creating a worse problem than we already have concerning environmental and human rights. So I would ask you, Professor, if you envisage this, this phenomenon happening, uh, in which uh, big costs uh, for a firm uh, developing an activity could also undermine small businesses developing activities in these regions. Uh, this could perhaps, for example, uh, be viewed as a big firm uh, providing uh, more costs and more expensive uh, investments for uh, econo eco developing economic activity in the Amazon and more sustainable practices in the Amazon that already occur cannot be uh, uh, developed because they do not have uh, ESG uh, standards, they do not have uh, GRC uh, standards, processes or, or actions and uh, what do you think about this perspective, if it could happen or, or, or not? What are your, your, your 
your thoughts about that. Thank you very much. Well, I will be very brief because I think Ana Luis and, and Mateus have uh, also something to say about this. I completely, complete, I'm in mute, no. I'm completely against uh, with, or not against, but I don't believe in certifications because of the reasons that you said. It implies some costs and they normally they leave uh, out uh, medium and small companies be, because exactly of, of these issues. And also because medium and small companies, they, the processes are much easier and simplified that uh, and without this complexity of multinationals where you have to, to pass uh, over 25 different desks in order to get the final stamp. No? In medium and small businesses, as you all know, is, is different. So having an oversight and controls uh, over the processes is simpler. Obviously, you don't necessarily have to, to, to get them documented in the best way yes but for instance there are a lot of regulations in uh, all over the world that um, oblige um, companies legal entities to have a whistleblowing mechanism so i i have a company together with my sister and that's it and we have to employees so uh, it doesn't make any sense no uh, so that kind of of uh, of issues are something that we have to consider it no the spanish legislations uh, with regards to corporate criminal liability makes difference between uh, medium uh, and small companies and large companies the u.s the european union directive on whistleblowing puts this obligation only to companies over 50 employees, I think, but it doesn't matter. It represents, uh, it represents some cost and per se leave uh, small and medium companies out, uh, out of this game. And this is, this is, uh, this is one of the risks as well rankings. We will never see rankings of the small and medium companies regarding compliance or integrity or ESG. Uh, we always see the, the big companies, no? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the Petrobras and uh, Itau and, uh, well, the all, the, the, the Brazilian and Latin American big companies, Bimbo, Claro Vision, something like that. We will never focus on that. I think there, there is an opportunity to work, especially with the associations, with the business associations that um, englobe or include small and medium and family uh, businesses. If we can elaborate with them some applicable indicators to the, the, to the horizontal level of all these companies and put them at their disposal in order that they can evaluate themselves using these tools, then at least it will be a step in order to include these medium and family business that are important. And they obviously, they don't want to compete with the multinationals. They want to compete or they want to, to see if they are doing some progress. So they are competing in the best case against uh, their past, uh, I would say. So certification and rankings, in my opinion, it's, it's a little bit risky. Uh, and we should think about other kind of uh, ways to motivate and to convince companies to implement some, some controls and mechanisms. Pressure, if I may, I have also one question. Uh, recently, uh, in another presentation, I heard a professor, I think it was Professor Surya, Professor Surya Deva, 
uh, mentioning that despite the ESG idea of social entrepreneurs fighting issues like inequality and the climate crisis, and now we talk about climate litigation too, we should think more about turning from all of our profit driving capitalism. So the idea was that after the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, we could reframe our own economic system and reveal structural market practices in the line of what proposes Professor Rebecca Henderson in the book uh, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. Uh, which is based on the idea that without a strong and inclusive democracy, capitalism cannot sustain itself. So she says that uh, free markets and free entrepreneurs uh, are absolutely fantastic, but they need to be structured. So if you tell um, to the business, hey, make the money, no rules, no limits, just go. So you are inviting him to force the wages down, to pollute the rivers um, and the oceans and cut down all the trees. And we should find a balance between the free market and also uh, uh, civil society. So I'm not saying let's love each other or everything's going to be beautiful, but I'm talking about looking at the things uh, as a negotiation, like uh, where everyone has its own interests. And cyber society has the role to keeping these two entities uh, in check. So in, the co in this context, do you think that uh, the ESG movement really has the strength to bring about significant changes in corporate business models or should we be discussing uh, more about a new way of capitalism? Well, this is the book that I was looking for. Uh, I think I have it somewhere. I haven't read it, I must confess. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's uh, in, in my opinion, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm Mexican now, and I grew up in Mexico, so, and I lived there for the first, 20 years uh, and because the perspective is different if you you don't see what we you don't see in germany what we all see in our country so i think it's about perspective and considering this then the idea of having a social capitalism is something that uh, it comes with also with our generation in order to to change the the chip the mindset a little bit and considering these aspects but i would say considering these aspects as a way to make money because it's very difficult to convince look in compliance something like very simple like com compliance and anti-money laundering and data protection issues and so on it's really difficult sometimes to convince companies to invest some money and human resources uh, in order to compl comply with these obligations because they don't they see this as a waste of money a waste of time a waste of energy it's not the priority of the company they don't see a risk because uh, the, the prosecutor, they are not interested in this. And in any case, if the prosecutor comes, you, you can solve it in another way. So if it's already difficult to make them invest in these topics, if we come with these ESG uh, matters with a perspective of you have to invest because uh, it's good, I think at this point, it's not enough, no? This social capitalism is not already uh, there, or at least in our country. We have to come to them because they are the, the change factors, the companies and the, the institutions. Uh, we have to come, them, to come to them with the idea of, if you do this, you will get more money and you will get more business or you will save money, then I think it's a little bit more attractive. We work with 
with a lot of local governments, especially in Mexico. You will think that it's not necessary to convince them to have some anti-corruption measures because it's a local government and anti-corruption is like, uh, no, it's for granted that they are doing this. But if you after hearing them, they don't want to invest because they don't see that as an obligation. They don't see uh, there is any, any kind of risk. But if you come with, to them and say, look, you can access to the funds of the Inter-American Development Bank. There are federal resources that are aimed to these uh, causes within your processes you are losing money that you as mayor don't you don't even know that you have these resources so the the money is uh, staying in the low levels of the of the pyramid no and after you detect these losses then you can do whatever you want you can i don't know uh, most of them they invested in the in their election or something like this but if you come with this monetarization uh, of the steps that they can take, I think for them is much more attractive. Unfortunately, this social capitalism, I think it will be something for the next years, but I don't see that right now, at least in Mexico. In Germany, it's completely different. No? My very personal opinion. Thank you so much, Professor. So, um, if we don't have any other questions, uh, Professor Menno, I would like to thank you so much for the high-level debate with so many challenging questions that certainly we will improve our understanding of ESG. And in the name of the Business and Human Rights Working Group and the MBA on Business and Ethics, of the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, we thank you so much for the presentation and for your time. If you agree, eventual questions from our participants will be gathered by our, by our team and addressed later by mail. And I just want to mention uh, that we have a series of webinars going on and we look forward to have all of you there too. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. To my fellow colleagues, Ana Luisa, my dear friend Ana Luisa, and my dear friend Mateus, and for the organizers, uh, to the organizers and Eduardo, obviously, and Gustavo, that I don't have the pleasure to know him personally, but thank you very much for organizing this, and congratulations for this series of, of, uh, of talks that you are carrying out. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Joao. And thank you, Daniel, as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>